Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's class. So we'll just give um, everyone five minutes to join in. Please, as you come in, write your name and your state and your party. Thank you very much. Four more minutes for others to join in. Um, hello, everyone. Good evening. Please, can you tell your members to join in, your classmates? The class is about to start and the attendance is still quite poor. Please, everyone needs to be around. Thank you all. Um, good evening, ma'am. Please, um, you have the host function. 
please can you make charlia she'll be the moderator for this evening can you make her a co-host i think you're the only one that can okay hi yeah thank you so let, me, let me look for charlia yes mm -hmm. charlia you can go ahead with the reading of the profile mm -hmm. Okay, good evening, everyone, once again, and welcome to this class. Please, as you come in, sign in your name and your party and your states. Thank you very much. So I'll be reading the bio of the facilitator of this class. Aisha to Ella John is a policy and advocacy strategist and community development worker. Aisha to has years of experience in community project implementation. She's interested in building a community aware climate smart Nigeria through capacity building and partnership development. Aisha is, is head of climate change at Clean Technology Hub. Thank you very much, ma'am. The floor is now open for you. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, Talia. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, good evening, everybody. Um, I feel bad um, keeping you here while the World Cup uh, finals is going on. I wish I could, it's just something I could run through quickly so that we can go back to watching the World Cup. But I'll try and be as fast as possible. Um, Lisa, I don't know who has the presentation to share. Okay, um, let me just see if I could do that. Just give me a minute. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, so this course is uh, climate change and governance. Um, just a, a, a brief uh, take through of what climate change means because a lot of people uh, believe that climate change is not a Nigerian thing and we do not need to worry about it. And um, recently there has been, um, we are in the governance class and politic political class. Um, so I can say this, there's been a lot of conversation within the policy uh, on uh, climate change and energy transition. So a few aspirants have been asked questions on it, and um, I wouldn't say they performed well on those questions. So um, hopefully, as you, as you are um, part of this class, when you are asked questions on climate change, as you get into governance, you will have a more favorable outing than our, our current candidates. Next slide, please, Lisa. Okay, so uh, normally we do a pre-survey, but um, today we are not doing that. Um, we'll just go through quickly as, uh, we'll just go through as uh, fast as possible so that uh, some of us, some of you can um, watch what is left of the, of the match today. Next slide, please. Okay, um, 
Lisa, are you able to play this or should we skip this? No, no, I'm not able to play it while sharing. Okay, okay. next slide, please. Okay, so before we talk about climate change, we'll have to um, define environment. Um, the word environment is derived from the French word envir environment, which means surrounding. This is everything around us, everything that encompasses us. And the environment is made up of everything around us, including air, soil, water, plants, and animals. Next slide. Now, climate change refers to the long-term changes in weather patterns. This could be to, uh, due to natural reasons, but um, now uh, human actions have been found to be the dominant cause of climate change. And human action that causes climate change is referred to as anthropogenic climate change. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, processes that contribute to climate change include combustion of fossil fuels, that is um, um, using our cars for industry use, for domestic uses, um, deforestation, cutting of trees, industrial practices, um, where we have um, a lot of industries, there's a lot of production and a lot of use of power and energy, and uh, a lot of use of raw materials. So high emitting energy sectors include the energy sector, um, the industries, like we said, because they produce a lot, agriculture and food, because of um, agricultural practices like um, um, uh, tree cutting, um, a lot of agricultural waste and transportation. Um, because we are in the part of a world, the world that doesn't have um, um, mass transit, uh, good mass transit, and, and um, almost everybody that uh, has to transit either goes by public transport or private cars. And most people prefer using their private cars. But what we have is a lot of private cars on the road, which leads to increase um, climate change, the effect uh, in, 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 uh, contributes to climate change. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, what GHG here means green, uh, greenhouse greenhouse emissions. But we are going to um, break down the, the climate change the climate change terms as we move forward, forward further. Now, what most people argue, and which is true, is that why are we talking about climate change in Nigeria or in Africa? Um, Africa contributes the least to climate uh, climate change global emission, which is true. But unfortunately, we are most vulnerable. Um, in the last few months, we've had a lot of flooding. And what happened with the flooding? Did we have a, a quick response from the governments? I only need somebody to, to answer. How was the response to the flooding? So you can raise your hand up or you can type in the chat. Chats. Thank you, Musa. Uh, Bello Musa, Muna Foundation. Please go ahead. So, just in, in a few sentences, how what do you think was our response to the flooding? Um, good evening. Um, the response was very, yeah, very evening. poor, and uh, it caused a lot of lives and properties because we are not prepared at all for such eventualities. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. And that's why we say Africa is the most vulnerable. Because though we contribute the most, when it comes to the effects of climate change, we 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 are we are we we we, we take most of the effects. When there's flooding abroad, you you will see. Um, I think the, when there was Hurricane Katrina and all those hurricanes a few years ago, you see the efforts that were made abroad. You will see uh, helicopters dropping food. You see them trying to rescue people. But yeah, there was none of that. It just went on, and the president said, "Okay, I'm giving people 90 days to come up with a response." And that was it. There was no rescue effort. There was no, there's no saying, okay, how, what have people lost? Let us try and contribute and let us try and um, um, do a, um, a mapping of what has been lost and see how we can um, um, uh, push through. But there was no, there's none of that. That's why we say we are the most, the most vulnerable because one of the effects of climate change happen, people here are most affected by it. And as we go on with the course, we'll see more reasons why we are the most vulnerable. Next slide, please. 
Yes, I'm seeing all your comments and, and, and they are all very valid. Okay, yes, so the common terms so that when you see these um, abbreviations, you are not lost. The common terms in climate change, you hear a lot of global warming. So what is global warming? Global warming is a gradual increase in global temperature over the past century, resulting in greenhouse gas emissions. So over the past century, the temperature of the, the temperature has been increasing gradually, gradually, gradually. And what we are what we are trying to do now is to bring the temperature back to pre-industrial levels, or at least close to how it was pre-industrial levels. Because if we don't, we are going to get to a, a point of disaster, and we are already seeing the disasters around us already. Then uh, greenhouse gas, greenhouse gases. These are gases that warm the atmosphere. We have carbon dioxide. We have methane CH4. And we have nitrogen oxide, and we have hydrofluoric carbons, HFC. Then mitigation. Mitigation is any in intervention or action to palliate climate change through reduction of greenhouse emissions. Next slide, please. Yes, I agree. It takes 30 years of loss to be controlled. That, that, that's a very sad response, unfortunately. Adaptation. Any adjustment in ecological, social, and economic systems in response to uh, climate change impact. And now what, what um, I try to tell a lot of my foreign colleagues is that even before we come with our interventions, people in communities have been doing adaptation for a long, long time. Because um, if you go to your village, um, to some of us from the South, South or from the Southeast, or even from the North, in the Northwest and the Northeast, you see that um, there has been drought. I've been, if, for those of us from the north, from the, for those of us from the northeast, there has been drought. Drought may have affected one or two parts of your villages, but you find your community members, the women, the farmers, the people around, are able to now bring out local strategies to adapt that um, drought and continue their farming. Am I right or wrong? So adaptation, mostly now we are trying to look at it from the front uh, point of foreign intervention, but. The truth is that most of our communities have been facing these issues and, been, and are not even waiting for help. They have their local adaptive modes, uh, modes and models that they are putting in to adjust to ecological and social changes in response to climate change. Thank you very much, Kristen. Kristen, you are here again. Nice to run into you again in this class. Climate justice. Um, advocates that climate, yeah. Now, this is for me, this is where my passion is in uh, climate change, climate justice. Um, I advocate that climate change should be viewed as a human rights issue because as we go further, you'll see why. There's a lot of rights issues. There are a lot of um, rights abuses that come with, with, um, with the effects of climate change, the secondary effects of climate change. And uh, recently we had an article out on climate change, insecurity, and um, the vulnerable population. So um, I will encourage you to read, read that. I'll share the link to you so that you, you have a fair idea, especially when it affects women and children. What, um, how, people are, how people are being affected, women and children especially, are being affected um, directly to the, with the effects of climate change. So we have the Conference of Parties. Um, every year, countries come together and they pick a country and they go and they have a conference and a meeting where they make, um, they discuss issues on climate change, they come up with uh, action points and they now work with futures implementing, implementing it. Um, this year it held in Egypt um, about a month ago in 2021. And, and, um, yes, 2021, it held, I think in Glasgow, yes. And um, that was when it was after the uh, meeting that our president um, signed the climate change law in the, the Climate Change Act of Nigeria into law. Next slide, please. So what are the effects of climate change? This, the primary effects are that we have increased temperature and stronger heat waves. Um, do you feel that in any of your communities, do you feel that the weather is getting hotter from February to April to May? Or you feel that it's a little cooler than normal years. Do you feel that every year it gets hotter, or you feel it's or, or, or in your own environment it gets cooler? In my own environment, it gets hotter. We have droughts, which is um, 
common in the, the, the northwest of Nigeria and part of the northeast. Then changing um, rainfall patterns. Like this year, I think the rain started earlier around April. Then a few, it went off, came in around July, around June, then here, there, here, there, here, there. Then it stayed to September, October. I don't know I, I a little bit of October. The thing is that what it does is that uh, for farmers, they are not able to predict the patterns of the rainfall so that they can plant and harvest as expected of them. So for those who want a successful planting season, they have to um, now look for other adaptation models because the rain pattern of the rainfall is not reliable for them to plant, to know when to plant and when they are going to harvest. And rising sea levels, those in Lagos who can relate to this because every year we have pictures of Lagos um, during the rains and when the sea levels rise, we have pictures of them in canoes, we have pictures of them. Um, just, we have pictures that people make fun of. Um, people ca um, um, kayak, I think it's that kayak, in, 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 on, the, on the main roads, people use canoes and the rest. And that's normal, almost normal for Lagos, even without the flooding. Then we have floods, which we experienced this year, which was the one of the worst we've seen. I think we, um, United Nations reported over um, 600 kills and over um, 100 of thousand displaced, displaced. We cannot even quantify the, we are not even quantifying the property lost yet. Olam farms alone lost $50 million, $50 million worth of rice. And that is going to affect our rice production next year. Then there's certification, which is more prominent in the Northeast and parts of the Northwest. Next slide, please. So secondary effects, these are some of the effects that come off from the primary effects. So when you have drought, you have the desertification, you are, you are unable to plant because you don't know how the rains are going to go or when you plant and you lose your, your yields because of how the, um, the weather is, you have food insecurity. And like I said, the land farms lost over $50 million worth of rice that they planted because the whole farm was submerged in floods. So that means the over how many hectares of rice cannot be cultivated for next year and that will affect the food that we are supposed to have next year. Then we have displacement and forced migration. So when your um, um, when the sea levels rise and sometimes flooding villages take over whole communities, people have to move. Like what we saw in Bielsa, people were moving Bielsa. Um, I think 60% of Bielsa was under the flood. Even our former president had his house flooded. So you, you cannot live in a flooded area. So people have to move. And um, where you have more um, extreme conditions, people still have to are forced to move because it's either you, if you stay there, you will die or you will drown. Competition for limited natural resources. That's why we have the farmers had us uh, uh, cl uh, uh, clashes in the north central and the north, some parts of the northwest, which has snowballed into a whole different security situation. All challenges and loss of biodiversity. Next slide, please. Next slide, you, as you can play this, um, Lisa. Okay, so um, you'll be wondering, I'm in a governance class. I mean, I'm supposed to be studying politics. What's my business with climate change and, gov and climate change? Um, the truth is that in the next five, in the next 10 years, and it has already started, these five issues are going to dominate um, national and international conversations on governance and in the international space. The first is post-COVID recovery. Um, a lot of countries are still trying to recover. Not a lot of countries, the whole world is still trying to recover from the loss incurred from COVID, and uh, both economically and uh, physically, and also in terms of the human beings that were lost. Then security. Uh, the insecurity we face in Nigeria is not just in Nigeria, it's in other parts of Africa. And because of that, there's a lot of migration back and forth to other countries. So that is also going to be an issue that is going to be continued to be discussed. And we also have the Ukraine-Russia crisis. Then food security. And this is global because um, it's a global issue. Um, technology, 
um, developments that have happened in technology. Yes, I agree, Christian. The, the developments that have taken place in technology in the last few years have been outstanding. Um, thanks to technology, when COVID happened, uh, people were still able to work. And even after COVID, people were still able to um, adapt to working. We now realize that, no, you don't have to keep going to work every day. You don't have to go to work every day. So we had offices that started doing um, working from home. We had offices that started doing hybrid working. You work some days from home, you work some days from the office. The technology is going to play a huge part in the next 10 years of national and international politics. Then climate change, because um, the climate affects every single part of our lives. It affects how we live, where we live, um, what we do. It affects every bit of our life. So it's going to dominate national and international political discussions for the next 10 years. Next slide, please. So um, climate change is not people. One mistake that we have made earlier, uh, we made in the space earlier, is making climate change an environmental issue. But it is not. It's a governance issue. Because uh, like this flooding now, it was we are all seeing that is a it was a failure a failure of the response was failure of governance I mean. because if the government had um, honored its um, um, honored the agreement with Cameroon to build their own part of the dam, it wouldn't be in this we wouldn't have this crisis that we had with the flood, and if there was a functional system of responding to flood rescuing people. Um, getting them off the, on, and even town planning, we wouldn't have this issue that we had with flood. So it's a governance issue, and it has to be seen as that. Um, changing climate, changing climate affects different aspects of human endeavors and the state. Yes, it does. So climate change affects every other part of our lives. Like I said, it affects how we live, where we live. It affects our health. It affects our security system. It affects transportation. It affects housing. It affects migration. It affects economy. And it affects the vulnerable women, vulnerable groups, especially women, children, indigenous communities, and people who are living with disability. Disproportionately, that is, they are more affected than the uh, rest of us. So this was even for last. This is even for last year, not even for for for, for this year now that we are even uh, we even had the flooding. As at last year. 90% uh, of farmers depended on unirrigated plots. And um, so most of our, our, our food that we are depending on to live and to um, that we, are, we depend on in Nigeria is rain-fed agri. Only 10% is by irrigation. So this forces is now farming. So you can only farm certain things at certain times. And so when that season is gone, you have to wait for the next year to farm those, those things. And because of changing patterns of rainfall, you do not even know when to start farming because you can plant now and you now have a dry spell and your whole planting goes to waste. And also flooding. Like I said, I keep going back to land farms because I don't want to imagine the kind of um the kind of the kind of the kind of um uh, uh, food insecurity we are going to have next year. So this was Neymar's flood outlook for 2022. And it's rightly predicted that over 32 states and FCC are under the risk of floods. Even though I don't know if they, they predicted specifically the release, the, the release of the dam in Cameroon, but that was for two, the outlook for 2022. But even though they predicted it, nothing much was done to, to save that, to stop that. In Katsina in 2021, they already um, reported the loss of 1.7 million metric tons of rain due to drought caused by climate change. Next slide. Now, um, beyond just us losing food, agriculture, uh, pro, uh, the loss that we are going to face from agri in the next three years is going to cost over 30% of Nigeria's GDP. And we are trying to diversify, we are trying to move away from an oil based economy. And we are now gradually losing 30% of our GDP without any preventive measure, without any proactive measure to stop that. And beyond the figures, we are all feeling the effects of food shortages as witnessed by rising cost of food stock. I know what my food bill is now. 
I know that mostly, whatever, mostly what we earn now is just goes to food. Let's just even have money to eat. No money, there's no money. Before we could say, oh, there's money, you can set aside money to do all that, money to buy clothes, money to buy, to just have fun, money to relax. But now most of the feeling that you, most of the money you you have, you make goes towards feeding because of the high cost of food stuff. A bag of rice went from 8,000 Naira in 2015 to over 40,000 Naira right now. And we are even next year, we are even hoping that we will see the rice, we will see the food to buy before we even start talking about the cost. Beyond the challenges of the weather, insecurity resulting from climate change, resulting from the struggle for land is also leading in food shortages. Because most, if you go to my some of my some of the villages in my in my plant state, you see that farmers have abandoned the village because of insecurity and they have been taken over. Um, they've been sent out of the land and they are not producing. And we are not even we are not even afraid of the impact of that. And this has been going on for years. So for almost every year, we are falling short of the food that will be produced by those lands, in those lands. Next slide, please. Now, insecurity. This is the, I think, one of the most critical part, parts. So um, Boko Haram. A lot of people think it's just because it's just a religious war. What ha actually happened with Boko Haram was that um, the late chat started shrinking about 20 years ago. Before then, um, those people who know Medugri will know that people used to come from all parts of Africa and all parts of Nigeria to buy fat fish in Baga. Baga was a very huge fish market, and that's why we had the Lake Chad. Now, the Lake Chad started shrinking. So farmers who dependent, do dependent, who depend depend on um sorry fishermen who depends who depended on that um on, on lake chad for their source of income and the traders who were there selling had to start moving to the state capital because they are part of the the lake the, the lake chad was shrinking so they are moving to the state capital and there was nothing for them to do and so that was when they this mama this uh, mama Jusu, who was killed a few years ago started um keeping them he will feed them and say and part of what they were doing with the with the people that were being fed and kept there was that you have to attend their um yeah it's supposed to be at the Islamic school but it wasn't it was a school where they were indoctrinated with um extreme ideology and that was how Boko Haram grew the drought in the northwest we really know the effects the droughts, land was drying, everywhere was drying, and, and we see that every year, every year, um, during particular parts of the year, headers start moving down south. And they feel that, okay, this is these are their grazing routes. Now, because of the struggle for land, and because even the farmers are moving from drier areas to areas that are more productive, they get into the grazing routes. And so when farmers come and feel that this is their grazing routes, they go, even if you have your farm there, they just come there, and you have insecurity, you have, um, you have, clashes with them. You have farmers and headers clashing. And before you know, whole villages are burned down, whole villages are affected. And we know how this has gone. It is now even beyond farmer headers uh, issues. It's now, into, it's now becoming um, a, kidna a multi-billion naira kidnapping industry. Next slide. Yes. So um, climate change and healthcare. So beyond these ones, I want to speak. I want to uh, speak specifically on the flooding that we experienced this year. So for this year, by January, in January, um, in January, cases of cholera were around 200, 300. In January 2022 around 200, 300. But by July, when the flooding started, cases of cholera went up to 3,000, 3,000 plus. And by September, it was over 4,500. By October, it was over almost 4,000, almost getting to 5,000. So you can see that it was almost uh, over 400% increase, increase from January to when the flooding started in July. Why? Because these are the issues that come with some of the effects of climate change. And the color, it, it, there were, um, there, there, of course, there's a lot of mortality because people are actually just trying to get out of the floods. We are not even having able to account 
those who were not reported. These are those the reported figures, those that went to the hospital. There are some that will stay at home and die. And um, climate change also brings a lot of um, respiratory disorder, cerebral, uh, cerebral spinal meningitis when the heat gets too much, skin cancer, malaria. We know, of course, we know malaria. When we have environments that are flooded, breeding ground for mosquitoes, high blood pressure. For somebody that has lost all their their life possessions to, to the flood and they have lost their family too, so those are some of the things that could happen. And also, uh, one thing climate change does, one, one thing the effect of this uh, um, things happen is that it overwhelms the health structure. And in areas where they, we had flooding, children who were supposed to be immunized and the, health, the, the, the primary health care center is flooded, where are they supposed to go and get their immunization? So it also disrupts our immunization timetable. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Infrastructure. So as people move from areas that are flooded, because now some people that have experienced this flood, they are not going to go back to their villages or their houses where, where it was flooded. They want to move to city centers. They want to move to places that are, are less prone to flooding. But those places are now get, will now be overcrowded. You now have more people than um, are planned for in those areas. You now have trees. Areas that are supposed to be green, you now have trees being cut down and replaced by housing estates. And when these estates start coming up, people will dig their boreholes. Sometimes they do not even obey the, because every borehole is supposed to be 20 meters apart. But they do not obey this, especially in Abuja. Almost every house now, you want, they want their own personal borehole. But what this does is that it, 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 um, distributes, it, it disturbs the balance of the earth. And a few years ago, we started having tremors in Abuja. And this is one of the reasons that we've had, we start having tremors. And God forbid that we get to a point that we start having earthquakes because we have destabilized the balance of the earth by digging boreholes. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the one that affects me very, this one that affects me most. Because when you have flooding, when you have insecurity, you have people who become displaced and vulnerable. And this is worse for women, this is worse for children, this is worse for young people, this is worse for people with disability. Um, uh, people who, who are on wheelchair, imagine how they are going to be able to move if they wake up in the night and their house is flooded. How do they start moving? How do they start pushing their wheelchair? Especially those that use the electronic wheelchair. How do they start pushing their wheelchair out of, out of the flood and are moving out of people? People who are blind, that are already used to passing certain routes. routes. So if there's insecurity, how do they know that this is the route to avoid and this is the route to pass when they do not, if they do not have people that are helping them? People who are deaf or who have hearing impairment, like a story I've always shared. Baba that woke up uh, in the morning, he was his death. He just slept, woke up in the morning, saw his whole village had been burned down. He was sleeping, he didn't know what was happening. So his whole village had been burned down. And he just carried his dane gun and said, ah, let me walk to the next village and see what is happening because he's a hunter. And on the way, but the soldiers just saw him. They said, actually, he, of course, he's deaf, he's dumb, he could, he's uh, he hearing and uh, speaking impairment. He couldn't speak, he couldn't hear them. And they just arrested him and they sent him and locked him up because he had a dane gun. And he was there. He could nobody to communicate with him. Till this end, uh, Joe Raggi went to do some prison visitation and they found him there. He was somebody had been looking for him and assumed that he had died during the attack. So these are also this is these things are, are worse for people with disability because their ability to cope normally with some of these things is less than people who are not living with disability. So this is just one IDP camp, just one, uh, where they did the head counts, 12th of uh, April, 2022. So you can see that, that just one camp has 832 women, one, one, um, 1,209 nine women, 1,814 children, 25 pregnant women, and 17 people living with disability. This is just one camp. So if you now go around and you do a head count at all the, in all the camps that we have, not just in Katina, but in all the states. You can imagine all the numbers will come up to. 
So Nigeria, uh, our response to climate change, uh, we had the first national strategic plan in 2011. Then we had the, we ratified the Paris Agreement in 2017. Then we updated our national determined contribution. That is how we have planned to be reducing our greenhouse gas emission yearly. Um, in in twenty in twenty 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 one after COP, so we plan the Nigeria plans that we reduce our greenhouse gas emission by twenty percent um, in twenty thirty and forty seven percent by twenty fifty. That's the plan. But how how well are we doing? Are we even doing anything on that? That is a question that um, I will leave you to answer after the after the course. Next slide, please. Um, in Nigeria, like I said earlier, we signed in the climate change law in 2021. Um, this includes the formation of a climate change council. Uh, it's supposed to be headed by the president, charged by the president, and the, the, the we have a secretariat that is headed by director general. I think director general was appointed in September. Um, now, the, the, good, the thing about the law is that it, it, it introduces a carbon budget for public and private sector organizations. A carbon budget is not like a real a, a budget per se. It means that this is the amount of carbon emission that each organization, private or public, is allowed to emit within a year. And if you surpass that uh, emission, you are going to pay a carbon, what we call a carbon tax. So the vision for Nigeria's climate change policy is a low carbon uh, climate change resilient Nigeria. Next slide, please. So um, Nigeria has a, we have a national de development plan and um, this is coordinated by the Nigeria Circular Economy Working Group. Um, this is jointly done by the Federal Government of Nigeria and the African Develop ba Development Bank. And the aim is to produce a 10 year transition plan for Nigeria to a green economy. That is from how we live now to how we are going to be producing less carbon. Um, my organization, Clean Technology Hub, has made a lot of inroads in leading advocacy, research, and incubation of green um, enterprises, gender and youth inclusion in the process of green uh, transition to a green uh, Nigerian green economy. Next slide, please. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, the Rural Electrification Agency has been driving an upgrade rural electrification project and um, solar power, targeting 5 million new solar connections by 2023. And uh, next year, 2023. So, probably by next year, we'll take stock and know how far that has gone. But I know that, yes, uh, uh, some schools, some villages are being powered by solar. And this is not just by the public, by the government, but also by private sector investors. Um, transportation, um, transition to green transportation has been considerably slower, yes, because we are still importing our vehicles, we are not even producing locally. But we have um, Mustafa Gajibo, he, is, he, he works, he's, I think he's from Sokoto, but he's, he works in a degree, probably because of the, um, the amount of sun there. And he has been, he first started by, um, um, trans, um, do, um, 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 trans, transforming fuel car, uh, fuel buses to electric buses. When he has an electric terminal where he charges them. After that, a few years um, this year, he was able to produce the first electric bus in Nigeria and it's operational. So he has these buses and he's been running for over two years and he keeps improving and expanding and, and he's getting a lot of uh, support. Uh, our organization is one of those that highlights and, and projects him. For agriculture, we have reforestation programs. And let me tell you a funny story with that. So um, some of our reforestation programs are now becoming a problem because kidnappers are now going to live in those forests. <laughs> so when you are trying to solve one problem, you are now bringing another problem. And kidnappers are really enjoying those forests. So to now even to now even um, get to those kidnappers and those um, uh, bandits, 
You said you now have to start bombing down and bringing down those trees again, which is taking us back a whole round cycle. Ranting is also one of the methods that we are pushing and encouraging to be adapted. Smart agriculture, we have soilless farming where um, um, the plants are, 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 so, are um, farmed without uh, being uh, so without tilling the ground. We have water saving and irrigation. We recycle farm products instead of burning and uh, bush burning and burning products. We recycle them and even use some of them for clean cooking. Next slide. Yes, clean cooking. And uh, the government set a deadline for 2020, 2030 for clean cooking. That's the end use of kerosene and firewood and kerosene, firewood and coal for cooking. I don't know how realistic that is, but we'll discuss that when we come to the question and answer session. Um, we've, as an organization, Clean Technology Hub has been training and helping women have uh, access to clean cooking stoves. Um, recently, during the 16 days of violence against women uh, uh, activism, we were able to train uh, women in our bomb, over 200 women in our bomb on the use of clean cooking stoves, and we gave some of them the stoves for free. And uh, waste management, so we, and there's a waste, man, uh, waste management policy where recycling, and if you, if I don't know um, where some of you live, but you can see, you see that recycling is becoming a big business. A lot of organizations are going into recycling, and also empowers these women that clean the roads, because most of these recycling companies give them um, a token, for every gram of um, plastics that they bring. So that really helps. That has really helped so far, but this has been mostly by private sector more than government efforts. Next slide, please. Yeah, so challenges, loss and damages. What do you mean by loss and damages? People that have lost their, their farm produce, they have lost their, their homes that have lost their families to the effects of climate change. Who compensates them? How do you compensate them? There's been a lot of debate on loss and damages at uh, COP, at different conference of party COP. This year, our president was very angry and other countries, other um, African countries are also very angry because we produce like, we produce the lowest, um, we produce the lowest emission. But we are facing the worst damages, even though these are some of, some of the issues that are a problem of governance with the African countries. But this is not our way. We, we do not cause these problems mostly. But we are facing the worst damages. And the countries and the industries that are benefiting from this abroad, that are producing this uh, climate change, are not um, actually paying enough compensation for the loss and damages that are, are, being, um, are being witnessed from climate change. So this is an ongoing conversation and every organization, uh, we are um, particularly um, advocating for loss and damages to be paid for women, children and vulnerable people who are, who are most affected when uh, climate change happens. In adequate insurance cover, um, Olam Farms thankfully was insured, but how many farmers have insurance? When they lose their products from drought, from flooding, from um, deforestation, from insecurity. How do they get what some of them, sadly, unfortunately, they develop health problems and die. Some they do a lot of, but how many insurance companies are even willing to cover and a, 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 a system, a farming system that is not so reliable, that's not so predictable? That is one of the issues. For awareness. Why you go to talk about climate change and people are looking at you and say, ah, that is an horrible problem. And this is not just for the lower strata people. These are people that are high up there. You go to talk to, and you go for, to people that should know these things and they'll tell you that, no, this is a horrible problem. This is just something that you want us to, to, be, to, be, to want to make money from. Economic downturn. Almost every country is still recovering from um, post-COVID economy and most countries are reducing their spending. So when we now start coming up with loss and damages and all these things, and uh, we are even telling people, okay, move from um, using fuel to electric or move from using coal to gas. How do they fund this? How do they fund this movement? Insecurity. 
Like I, when we are trying to solve one problem of uh, climate change, we now go into another problem that, um, like uh, we do now go into other problems with the security. Like I gave the example of where we have bandits taking over our green areas that we are trying to. We have been building um, um, planting trees to reforestation. Next slide, please. Okay, so quickly, this is a classwork for everybody. Um, knowing the problems of climate change. So as an individual, or when you get to a position of power, how do you, what do you think you can do to protect the environment? This is a quick class assignment that we'll do for 10 minutes, uh, for five minutes, and we now um, uh, round up the class for today. Um, okay, thank you very much, Ma. Sorry, I think Charlie, maybe her network went off. She's no more a co-host. Maybe you just kindly help us make her so she could handle the moderating. Thank you, Ma. Okay, so um, I have some um, responses in the chat group. Um, Caroline Equestry says, create laws to protect the environment and ensure they are implemented. So Caroline, you only want to admit and tell us how you do that. And Amaret says, encouraging, encourage the planting of at least one tree in one's area. Okay, Quado. Dofan, please unmute. Unmute your mic and, and, and summarize in one minute. Thank you. Uh, hello, good evening, ma. Thank you for the class. And um, Hi. so um, as an individual, I think the best thing for an individual to do is dispose waste in a climate friendly way. Stop burning your waste. Um, dispose your waste. I think we have, um, if you live in an environment that has um, these waste carriers, I think I think almost every local government have one. So dispose waste in a very good way. Don't, no burning, no just throwing in the gutter because th that adds to flood, flooding and all. No throwing of um, bottles from the window and stuff like that. So you dispose your waste properly. That's what to do that is individual also as an individual you can plant flowers around your house or just one tree maybe one tree in the middle of your compound or something like that it will add to uh, um, the oxygen in the environment it, i mean it looks like one tree can do a lot but at least you're doing something you're adding your own quota as an individual also that individual and that's what you can do to educate um, people around you this is someone trained liters on the floor, train liters in the gutter, you'd be like, this, this liter you are train block the waterway and you probably cause flood and cause issues during the rainy season. You don't have to like create a big, but I think talk one-on-one -on -one to one person, two persons, and just let the change start from you. Then as someone in power, I think the best thing we can do is um, afforestation. That's uh, Afforestation in a big way, you know, like plant trees in the whole environment. Another thing you can do is to create laws, um, like you were saying. Um, the um, um, I think uh, that's, that's, a, that's a term you use for signing the maximum, the maximum um, carbon an organization can emit into the air. Yeah, enforcing such laws because I think we have that, but I don't know if it's being followed by the organizations we have so enforcing those, those laws if you are someone in power and also building dams 
did, did it like if Nigeria had completed her part in the Cameroon Dam, I think we wouldn't have as much flooding as we had. So if you are someone in power, you just do those stuff that you are supposed to do. Basically, do your job and do it right. I think that's all from my end. Thank you very much. Well, that was really that's that was really a lot. Thank you very much. Um, I have an interesting question. Maybe I'll just respond to that before we go from and from the chat box. Um, somebody's asking. I'm trying to sorry, my my yes, okay. So somebody was asking um if uh, in the, in insurgency and crimes contribute to climate change issues. Yes, they do, and it's a circle, like I said. Um, first of all, a lot of the crimes that we have became crimes because of the climate change. I wish uh, we were able to play the documentary, because, uh, the first documentary, Nowhere to Run, but I, I'm hoping that you'll be able to find it on YouTube and watch the full documentary. You now understand, you understand fully the link between insecurity and climate change. But speaking um, generally, the militants in the Niger Delta, how did it happen? because of the environmental pollution. Boko Haram, like we already said, happened because people were losing their income from the shrinking the chart. The crimes we have in the, the farmer headers issue that we have across the nation now is because of also climate change. And one thing again climate change does is that people that leave these their communities and move to other communities without a source of income resort mostly to crime. So these are issues that are intertwined and um, one, they are positive of the other. So yes, um, insecurity, climate change causes insecurity, insecurity causes, causes climate change. So um, any other comments? Let me read some of, let me read some of the comments uh, I'm seeing in the chat box. So, up. Yes, mm. plant a tree, plant a tree is very popular. As an individual that can protect the environment through acts of service in my community, yes. Educating people on climate change, very important. And also an advocate, mostly on the right. And that the problem is very important because most of us seem to be in denial that there's actually a problem with climate change. Uh, there's actually a problem of climate change. Like one presidential aspirant says, hey, we'll leave that climate change for them. So when we leave the climate change for them, when we now have flooding, who will now, how will we do with the flooding? See if we feel that we will leave the climate change for them. And that clause, yes, we have the laws, but some of the laws have not been domesticated and they are not being implemented. Make sure the opinions of women and girls, especially at community level, are factored into legislation. I, I honestly, I totally agree. Because like I said, these people are already living and uh, having the adaptive models of uh, of of adapting to the changes in the environment locally. So you don't just bring up a policy from outside and tell them that this is what they will start doing from now. Yeah, I agree that one what what could be one problem, another problem comes up. The government should first tackle the issue of insecurity, then put more funds on agriculture. All very good comments. Thank you very much. So so um uh, this slide is gone, but our recommendations Normally, it's the domestication of climate change law, especially in states that are most affected by um, effects of climate change, mainstreaming climate change resilience, international and subnational planning, uh, increased climate financing, commitment to loss and damages, especially to farmers and vulnerable groups, and full implementation of the climate change law. So with this, we are hoping that we'll have a stronger voice and we'll start reversing some of the effects of climate change. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope I didn't take too much of your time. I tried to be as brief as possible. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you very much, Ma. That was a very insightful class. I really enjoyed the class on my end. So now we'll move to questions. If you have questions, you can raise up your hands or drop your questions in the chat box. Someone. 
Okay, so we since we don't have any question. I believe we understood the class so well and I really enjoyed the class. I was able to get more breakdown on climate change and all of that, all the happenings and the gov what governments meant to do and all of that. So thank you very much, Ma, for the class this evening. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, Merry Christmas in advance and Happy New Year. I wish for, I look forward to see you guys next year. Thank you very much, Ma. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Ma. Thank you very much for the class this evening and encourage your party members to also be part of this class. So assignments will be dropped on Wednesday and enjoy the rest of your week, everyone. Thank you very much for coming out today. Do enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night.